All right. So welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. We're here at the Enviro House for our workshop with Britt McGrath with Tacoma, Tacoma Auto Bond Society. Um, we're going to be talking about friendly gardening for birds and pollinators, what you can do to make a pollinator garden. Um, and we're going to start with a couple of poll questions. Well, um, I want to wait. Like that. Yeah, about half of them in right now. So you can yeah. see the Enviro House and the image behind me, even though I'm not there. Um, and we are trying to build more of a pollinator garden there. We do have a lot of pollinating plants, native plants, low water plants. And if you haven't been there, um, the grounds are open that people can kind of stop and walk around a little bit, but they're not in the best shape because we aren't there to participate yet. So. Um, Kyla, maybe go ahead and start explaining the Q&A and the chat, how we're going to do that, and then maybe by then we'll have enough people in to start the presentation, the poll question. Yeah. Um, also, Janda, I just want to let you know, I'm not seeing the, uh, the poll questions on my side. Do you have the poll questions? I do. I don't right. know why you're not getting them if you're a co-host, but. Um, you know, constantly amazed by Zoom and all of its intricacies. <laughs> okay, well, um, why don't you explain the Q&A in the chat first and then I'll watch the first poll. Great, yeah. So um, today we'd love to hear all your questions. So if you have any comments or questions, you can put them into the chat or the Q&A. Um, if you send it to the Q&A, it may be harder for other people to see your question, um, but we can definitely answer things there. And um, at the end, we'll go over all the questions um, out loud together. Um, so I'll be monitoring the, the Q&A if you want to submit your questions there, but you're welcome to send things in the chat as well. And um, when you send things in the chat, you want to make sure you change the who you're sending it to. So right above where you type in the message, there's a two colon and a drop down menu. So if you want everyone to be able to see your comments and questions in the chat, you have to change the um, who you're sending it to to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your great comments and questions. If you want to send something just to us panelists, you can select just the all pa panelists. Um, but I think it's great if everyone can see all the questions. Um, and also, you know, if you have fun uh, comments to make about your garden, that's always welcome as well. Um, yeah. Okay. So we um, start every webinar. If this is your first time with us, we start by asking you what you heard about the webinar, and it helps us to know how to reach out um, in the limited ways we have right now with the Enviro House not being open, but we're trying to find more ways to let people know about what's going on. So this first poll is about how you heard about us in question one. And then question two is um, a short question that Kyla needs to ask you um, because she is a AmeriCorps member and this is something she needs to do. So do you want to explain that a second and then launch the poll? Well, actually I'll launch the poll and you can explain it while they're filling it out. Okay, hey, yeah, so after you let us know where you heard about the event today. Um, I have two questions, pretty simple. You don't have to think too hard about them, but I just wanna know um, how much you feel like you already know about how to make your garden safe and an inviting place for our native birds and other pollinators. Um, and then also how easy you think it would be to implement new gardening practices at home that are more bird pollinator friendly. Um, and I'm gonna ask these questions again at the end so we can get a sense of how much you've learned during the workshop and how empowered you feel to make changes in your own garden um, after hearing from Britt today. So, um, and this is something, as Janda said, for AmeriCorps, we do some uh, measurements on our environmental education efforts. So um, this is for me um, to show how, how, what I've done to, to help spread um, environmental education information locally. So, um, 
I really appreciate you taking time to answer those questions now, and then we'll answer them again at the end. Okay, so I'm going to leave this up just a sec couple of seconds longer because we have about 80% of you that have answered so far. Um, give you another chance to. Nobody went to the Enviro House Workshop website. Okay, we're at 92%. So I'm going to end the polling here. Um, we'll look at these answers and share results. So there you can see did. Can you all see that? Okay. So it looks like the majority got from the Embrenner's email. 30% um, got it from our Facebook um, links with Audubon and Thomas Sustainability. Um, and then a few with workplace email and friends and other. So. Yeah, Kyla. and Chris let us know in the, in the chat that they heard about it from the Shelton newspaper. So that's cool. Shelton, huh? <laughs> That's probably through Master Gardeners. They do a lot of promoting of some of the things that we have too. Um, yeah. And so the, the uh, poll that you have up, Kyla, it says that the majority said they know a little bit, but have a lot to learn. So, Great. And they think it would be somewhat easy to implement. That's good. Okay. All right, well, let's proceed here. Um, we'll introduce, um, Britt again, and Britt, you can tell something about yourself and and then we'll get into the screen sharing and go forth. All right, thank you so much. Again, I uh, told you guys in the chat, I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Britt McGrath. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm coming at you from Tacoma today, which is traditional coast, coastal Salish and Puyallup lands. Um, I am the Outreach and Education Manager at Tahoma Audubon Society. We are a organization that is over 50 years old with a small staff of two and soon to be three people and a mighty, mighty crew of volunteers that we rely on for a lot of our um, work that we do. We serve all of Pierce County. Um, our offices are located in University Place at Adriana Hess Wetland Park which is 2917 Morrison Road West. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later and how you can visit us. Our offices are currently closed to the public, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, but we are at a wetland and our trails are open from dawn to dusk. So we hope you uh, feel empowered by this presentation and we'll come visit us a little bit um, afterwards if you haven't been there already. So, can well, I start sharing? We'll take off. All and right. I'm going to stop my video. And um, if you want to do your question early, then Kyla can jump in with that poll too. All right. Um, do, 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 let's see here. <clears throat> from beginning. All right. So what was my question, Kyla? Remind me. <laughs> yeah, so we, we do have um, one more poll question to um, just to find out, um, you know, how everyone, how much everyone feels like, or how familiar everyone is with native birds and native plants. Yes. Yeah, so um, today we're talking about creating a bird and pollinator friendly garden and obviously Tahoma Audubon connects people to nature through birding, recreation, conservation and um, education. So one of the poll questions is about how much you know about native birds and, and plants and animals. So I'd like to know a little bit about what folks know. So if you want to launch it now, that'd be great. Thank you for the prompt. And I yeah, Janda, can you? Yeah. How do I get it up here? Um, 
if you go to the, the poll, there's a, a drop down where you can select the, the questions at the top of the polling. Aha, uh -huh. okay. There we go. Learning as I go. As we all are. So how familiar are you with Northwest birds, pollinators, and native habitat? Just so we get a feel for where we're at. This will be helpful for, for Britt, so Britt can, you can tailor your, your talk mm -hmm. a little bit to how familiar everyone is already. Yes. We've got about 6% who've answered. We'll leave it a few more seconds. Um, and then Britt will be addressing all of these areas. So by the time we get through, you'll know a whole lot more. Okay. Uh, looks like we're stuck on 60%. So I am going to end the polling and we'll go from there. Okay. So it's pretty even. I, yeah. Surprisingly, there's nobody that answered that they just recently moved here. We get a lot with plants, um, that they know all their plants and their trees and birds and things from other parts of the country, but they're new here. So that doesn't appear to be the case. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. So um, one thing I do want to say is that there is obviously some science that goes into this and some of the resources that I'm going to share from Audubon and other um, other resources have there's a lot of research that goes into it specifically about how we care for the earth and what effects we have on our pollinators with what we're doing in our human uh, lives. Um, but also some of this will be my own experiences and my own suggestions um so and what i have had success with and what i have not had success with and at the end of the day gardening is kind of trial and error and um you can get a lot of knowledge out of it a lot of joy out of it and at the end of the day we can help our pollinators as well um so for those of you, I didn't see an answer that said, I am an expert, expert gardener, expert pollinator gardener. I know everything about pollinators. And if I think that we should all be lifelong learners and I am so open to anyone sharing their experiences, sharing things they know in the chat, um, because I think that we can all learn from each other. And I think that's a good part about being an educator, which is what I get to do on a daily basis. So always open to your information and, and insights. So without further ado, here we go. So what is a pollinator garden? A pollinator garden, in its sense, uh, provides nectar sources, water, nesting sites, and protective cover for native species of bees and other pollinators, such as birds, butterflies, small pollinators, which we'll talk about. And pollinator gardens can come in many different shapes and sizes to kind of fit to where you're at in your world and your life. Um, pollinator gardens, what I'm going to be focusing on today is I will focus on some specific pollinators, some specific ways to get pollinators to your pollinator garden, some specific plants, but also I'm going to be focusing on the fact that pollinator gardens provide a habitat for many different types of species of pollinators and habitats, providing habitats and natural habitats is part of what we can do to increase the biodiversity in our ecosystem. So a couple of things that I will be doing is sharing resources because we are Audubon Society. We do focus on birds. And um, one really great resource that you can find is Plants for Birds on the National Audubon Society website. Plants for Birds is a program that is um, basically a native plant ID uh, or database 
that you can search uh, your location and uh, see what what plants are native to your location and also what birds would be attracted to those plants. So it does focus a lot on native plants to attract birds. And we'll go into a little bit later about why native plants are best and most important to be planting in our pollinator gardens. So the first bird I'm gonna talk about I think is really accessible um, and really special. It is the hummingbird. So this is kind of a roadmap for when you're just uh, deciding how to plant and why to plant and where to plant your pollinator garden. These are all things we can think about is what plants to plant, specifically hummingbirds, Pacific Northwest plants that hummingbirds are interested in um, using as a pollinator is bee balm, flowering red currants, salmonberry, columbine, lupin, fox, rose of Sharon, lilac, and elderberry. Um, food sources. The reason that we have food sources for our uh, resident hummingbirds is because they actually rely partially on humans for year-long sources of food. So the Anna's hummingbird is an example of a hummingbird that stays in western Washington all year round. And partially the reason for that is because humans put out nectar feeders, so hummingbird feeders. So one thing that's really uh, important for any bird feeders that you're putting out is proper care and cleaning. This year we found an influx of uh, salmonella happening in bird feeders due to a pretty big um, eruption of pine siskins and people were asked to take down their feeders and it kind of made us aware of how we are cleaning and caring for our feeders. So any type of bird feeder that you're putting out needs to be cleaned with either a bleach or vinegar solution at least once a week. Um, so that includes hummingbird, hummingbird feeders. Um, the thing about hummingbird feeders is basically it's just a four part sugar to one part water mixture. Um, you can purchase it from stores, but typically you'll find a red dye in it. It's a little bit more expensive and it's not necessarily needs to be red. Hummingbirds are attracted to the color red though, which they'll find in a lot of uh, plant species that they typically are attracted to. Something that I recently found out is that hummingbirds don't just drink nectar from flowers. They also rely on protein from small insects that seek the nectar in flowers, such as fruit flies. So while hummingbirds are feeding, they are also eating fruit flies. One way to attract fruit flies, as we all know, to our area is to potentially put out um, banana peels or orange peels or something like that, which helps in our yards to attract those small insects and protein sources. Another thing that we think about when we're thinking about attracting birds and pollinators of other sorts to our uh, gardens and yards is water sources. Um, hummingbirds specifically prefer dripping or misting water and often will visit when you're watering. I love seeing my, the hummingbirds come to my yard when I'm watering my, my vegetable garden in the morning. So like I mentioned before, Anna's hummingbird is our resident bird, which means that it is here all year round. And the Rufus hummingbird is our migrant hummingbird, which is here in the summer, uh, spring and summer. So why do we want to attract and feed hummingbirds? This specific reason with hummingbirds is, this is a really cool fact pulled from Audubon. The Rufus hummingbird is, if based upon distance traveled in proportion to body size, undertakes the longest avian migration in the world. In order to sustain their supercharged metabolisms, all hummingbirds must eat once every 10 to 15 minutes, visiting between 1,000 and 2,000 flowers per day. So they're pollinating and they're eating, and that's a lot of work that they're doing for themselves and for our environment. Again, like I said before, pollinator gardens are basically a different type of habitat. So one thing that we want to think about when we think about our yards and these pollinator gardens is that these things can look messy. Um, birds, bees, butterflies, and insects typically need messy ground cover um, or and natural holes in the ground for nesting, laying, and overwintering. So this picture right here at the top is a picture of um, some holes in the ground that maybe nesting bees have been in. Um, this picture here is thanks to my friend Joe, who is actually a volunteer at Tom Audubon. He was trimming his rosemary and sage 
last week and found, I believe it looks like it might be a junco's nest to me. Uh, there's a lot of birds that nest um, and put their nests in the ground. And then this bird over here is the tohi, which is the Tahoma Audubon mascot. And its typical behavior along with juncos and robins and quite a few other birds is to kind of scritch and scratch along the ground, um, foraging, um, looking for nesting material and other things. So when you're planting your pollinator garden, one thing that um, you want to address is having um, some more middle height shrubs with foliage um, that they can hide, birds can hide in and then the foliage can fall to the ground and kind of stay there and provide a shelter in the winter and warm. Now we'll get into a little bit about um, how to plan, prepare, and plant your pollinator garden. And we'll take a maybe a little bit of a meandering path. So the first thing you want to consider is your location and finding a good spot. So like I said before, pollinator gardens can take all sorts of different shapes and sizes. One can be as simple as putting some potted plants out on your balcony or porch. So if you're in an apartment or a place without a yard, you can plant pollinator plants in pots. Uh, another space would be um, a planter box. So one you build or one that's already uh, at your house, you can have a small space uh, that is beneficial to you and to your pollinators. My suggestion would actually be to, if you're just getting into gardening, is to start with a limited space like this, to experiment and see what works and then to expand. Um, one thing you can do after that is to, if you have a, a pretty big grass yard, you can start digging up sod or grass while considering shape, size, and location of where you're putting that. So do you want a square rectangle pollinator garden? Do you want one that has more of a natural curvature shape? And where do you want that to go? And how big of a pollinator garden do you want? One tip that I typically suggest and is suggested on Audubon website as well is to spend a day in which it's sunny checking out where your future garden space is going to be every hour or two so you can track where the light is um, going in that area. Sketching or taking uh, photographs to kind of see how that progression is happening helps as well and helps with documentation, specifically because a lot of pollinator plants are going to have blooms and which means that they like sunnier spots. So here at my house, I have my pollinator garden is going to be on the south side of my house, which is the sunnier, more warm spot. And this is actually some pictures of, from my house. Um, so this is a site preparation. Um, so this picture down here is a south side of my house. This is actually just wildflowers that I planted last year. And um, they reseeded themselves and the calendula, these, um, these orange and yellow flowers here, which are medicinal and pollinator flowers, actually started blooming uh, beginning of March and are still going. Um, so this, this guy has been going on its own now and it has, um, as I was taking pictures, there were bees and butterflies flying all over. So locations are things to consider, like I said, uh, sunny spots and considering where the shade will be in the summer. And then also something that people don't always consider is that you will have to water these every once in a while. So are you close to a hose or do you have a rain barrel near, nearby? Another thing is, this is why I posted this. This is actually um, on the south side of my house too, but it is on the, you can see the sidewalk right here. So this is, um, this yellow plant is called the basket of gold. And then these are called evergreen candy tuff. And um, then I have some poppies and, and there's some lilacs up there. Um, these are all things that you walk around your neighborhood and see what people are growing. And you can, you can there's a lot of plant apps where you can take a picture and uh, see what that plant is. You can also see how I've left my dandelions here too for bees. Um, take a look and see what people are planting in your neighborhood and it can inform what grows well near you. Um, again, measure and see how much space you have and then take photos from different perspectives. This is obviously two similar perspectives, but you can take it face on. And then the reason you're measuring is to see how much space you have for the different plants you wanna put in and how big the plants are gonna go as you research them. 
And then sketches. It's a good idea to get a scale of drawings and shape for your garden. Um, this is, you know, how much garden do you want to take care of? What shape do you want it to go? How do you want it to flow in the yard? And then include what's already there. If you have a tree that's going to cast shade over it, pay attention to that. And when we go through this a little bit more, we'll talk about how we plan for that at Adriana Hess's Pollinator Garden. This one. So this is, this building is Adriana Hess, like I mentioned before, it's Adriana Hess Wetland Park um, in University Place. So we are in the process of planting a pollinator garden here. And these are some uh, pictures uh, when we were planning that we were uh, looking into. And I actually, we have a pool question for this. I was wondering, has anyone actually had a chance to visit Adriana Hess Wetland Park? That response is coming in almost everybody. All right, that's pretty close to almost everyone. I'll give you 10 more seconds. Awesome. All right, All right. Well, it looks like most people have never heard of Adriana Hess Wetlands Park, um, which I have to say was also me before looking at Tahoma Audubon's events this last mm -hmm. month. So mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a, one person has heard of it, which is great. Um, and one person would like to know some more and we're gonna get into that right now. So yes. um, let me put these away. So uh, Adriana Hess, like I said, is actually located on Morrison Road West, which if you've ever been to the Whole Foods in University Place, it's kind of behind there and a little bit uh, down the road. Um, it's like a little hidden gem. It's a small park. I would say it has between a quarter and a half mile of trails, which are gravel and accessible to wheelchairs, walkers, and strollers. You can also bring your dog there. In the back, it has a pond and it has a bunch of different um, types of um, uh, habitat there. There's mixed coniferous, deciduous, there's wetland, um, there's a little bit of a riparian buffer happening. And then there is a new pollinator and rain garden. So this is uh, Hess in the, I would say about February, we took this picture and this part right here uh, next to the building is what we cleared out in order to put our pollinator garden in. Now in front of it, there is a gravel feature that is uh, attached to our or kind of a catchment for our um, downspout there in order to have water flow into our rain garden. So the pollinator garden is going to be behind it and a little bit in front of that. Now you can see in this picture, this tree right here does not have any leaves, but in the summer it does leaf out and it casts shade during part of the day. So we decided to take an aerial view uh, snapshot of what this space looks like in the summer uh, when it's a little bit more shady. So these are all kind of tactics and tips you can use when you are um, working on kind of planning for your pollinator garden. Another really great tip we can use is to use spreadsheets. Um, some columns that you can put in your spreadsheet could be the bloom time, the bloom months or bloom times, name, height, how far things are gonna spread and colors that you're interested in having. Tips would be to use different heights and textures. Um, vary your bloom months. Pollinators, specifically bees, need nectar February through October. And there are plants in the Pacific Northwest that will bloom during those times. Again, native species are best. The reason for this, there's a lot of reasons for this. There's a lower amount of watering and maintenance, first of all. Second of all, a lot of them tend to be perennials, which means you only have to plant them once. Um, and they provide the most food, shelter, and natural ecosystem to native wildlife and pollinators. So that means they kind of sync up to the natural cycle of when pollinators are coming through our area. These things include um, bugs that, that live in them or in their habitats, fruit, nuts and seeds, and nectar. 
We have a really great um, page on our website at www.tahomaaudubon.org. That's called the ha Healthy Habitat page. It's under conservation. Um, and there's a lot of really great information there as far as native species and alternative pesticides. And um, there's just a lot of information on how to build a healthy backyard habitat. The other thing you can add to um, your garden is non-invasive and non-native species. So these will provide other sources of food, color, and cover variety. One thing you want to do before planting non-invasive, non-natives, is to check the Washington Noxious Weed Control Board or Washington Invasive Species Council just to be sure of what you're planting. Um, and then this is an example of what our spreadsheet ended up looking like as we planned for and, and as we planned at Adriana Hess. So you can see we have the plant names here. Um, these are some good examples of things that you can plant um, in your pollinator gardens at your house. Kinnikinnik, yarrow, borage, stonecrop, um, snowbrush, snowy fleabane, butterfly, butterfly milkweed, bee feed or bee balm, hummingbird mix, purple cornflower, common sage, and winter heather are all the things that we're planning. You can see we put in the scientific name as well and the heights, how and where it'll spread to, and then the bloom months and colors. Um, mostly we have perennials here. Um, and you can see there's quite a bit of variety in what we're offering. And um, I just wanted to add this to add some, some examples and some specific names of plants that we're putting in, uh, in ours. One thing you want to do actually while you are planning for um, your pollinator garden is there's a lot of what we call cultivates, uh, which are uh, flowers that have double blooms on them. Now, while double blooms are beautiful and wonderful to look at, they are not actually naturally how a flower blooms and will actually inhibit bees specifically from getting to the nectar in the flower. So you are going to want more of a natural species that does, is not a cultivate. So if you see anything with a double, triple, quadruple, et cetera, bloom, that is not going to be the best choice for feeding our pollinators and attracting our pollinators. So for those of us who are not so spreadsheet minded, this is the first diagram that came out of our planning. Um, so this is, as you can see here from the picture, this grayish right here is that water, that gravel water feature. And then we have uh, some of these plants that I mentioned. The ones in the front are going to be a little bit shorter and then they kind of go up the back. The ones closest to the, the um, building are going to be the, the higher, taller uh, types of, of pollinator plants. And so the reason I put this on here is that your planning is what works for you. So if you love spreadsheets, do that. If you want to just sketch out on a piece of paper, which is what I typically do, do that. Or if you want to put something into Word like this and make it really simple, that's absolutely fine too. The planning is nice though because it keeps you kind of in a limit or bounds and, and keeps you keeps you on, on a plan of what you're doing. Another option is to do something like this, which is take the pictures of the plants and put them along the, the plan of where your, where your location is. So you can get an idea here when our pollinator garden is blooming and rotating through its bloom stages, this is kind of what it'll look like. Um, and the colors that you have there, that's something that you want to take into consideration of what colors do you like. Um, another really cool thing to look into, which I do not have time to talk about today, is that birds and pollinators see in a different way than we do. They are more affected by ultraviolet colors. So we're talking about um, bees are very attracted to purples and yellows together. And this is why hummingbirds love red. They have very much more intense um, color spectrum than we do. The other thing here that is really important to note is that, so like I said, 
our pollinator garden at Adriana Hess is right next to a rain garden, which is in, is kind of a de facto water feature. Within that rain garden, though, we do have a, a kind of a, a flowing um, structure that will come down. And we actually have installed these kind of shallow bowls with some rocks in them, which first of all, birds love, but also other small insects like bees enjoy. Um, so all pollinators would love to have a water feature or water source. This can be bird baths, like I said, these shallow stone bowls, which is, you could even use the bottom of a planter, something really simple. Um, you can also have moving water, which is really good because it, it prevents um, anything from growing in there that might be something that you don't want your pollinators to ingest. Hummingbirds and other, other um, insects and animals also love that moving water misting situation. Birds and bees enjoy shallow rock filled bowls and puddles. Another reason which we'll get into just now is to avoid pesticides and other chemicals in your garden is because these um, pollinators will end up drinking out of puddles and if you are using chemicals on your garden those puddles will inevitably have those chemicals in them. So, um, something that we're also going to talk about is, like I said, alternatives to pesticides. So there are tiny pollinator plants called umbelliferous plants. I believe I pronounced that correctly. Um, they include things like fennel, yarrow, Queen Anne's lace. Um, this bottom photo right here is from my yard. It's um, called basket of gold. So there are these bugs or insects called beneficial bugs, which typically will feed on um, other types of pests that we don't want in our gardens. This can also be called a biocontrol. So lace wings are an example, ladybugs and beetles are an example, hoverflies, ground beetles and centipedes. All these things eat things like aphids or slug, larva or things like that. And so anything with a tiny flower like this is what they are gonna be attracted to for other sources of food like nectar. So something that I love about this presentation is that we keep continuing to go back to similar plants and suggestions to put in your pollinator garden and large size pollinators and small size pollinators will benefit. So yarrow is one, basket of gold, dill, um, coriander, lots of herbs and mints. Marigolds are great as well. So that's a consideration for something you might want to put near, around, or in your pollinator garden. And then if we talk about uh, alternative pest control, I am of the mindset that if something is not eating your plants, then your not garden is not actually part of the ecosystem. Because if you're putting so much pesticides on it that nothing wants to eat it, um, you're not creating space for insects and other pollinators, which are actually part of our ecosystem. So I'm gonna kind of quickly go through a list of ways to do pest control, especially if you have a yard in which you like to grow vegetables. Um, a lot of us don't want our vegetables being eaten by pests. So it, there's a couple ways that are very non-invasive, non-toxic um, removal, like hand picking, or pruning off the parts that have um, pests on them, or kind of doing a heavy water spray with the hose. Traps like sticky tape and beer traps for slugs. Um, repellents such as garlic oil, cayenne, and cinnamon. And then barriers like floating covers over your um, plants that kind of let, let light in, but um, don't let anything else in, let light and water mesh netting for birds to protect fruiting plants, and then sticky tape around trees to prevent um, bugs from crawling up there. Another thing you can do around your garden is to put cardboard, burlap, or pavers to tamp down any grass and weeds that could be um, a way for pests to get onto your plants. Soap spray is really great for aphids, one part vinegar, three parts water, and a few drops of dish soap. It ends up suffocating aphids, stink bugs, and caterpillars. Uh, one that, and then um, a couple more that are alternative synthetics would be neem oil, which it, it detracts aphids, spider mites, mold, and mildew, and white flies are small-bodied insects. 
It's not toxic to pollinators um, because insects must eat it in order for it to work. And these things, um, the oil, any oils you put on or anything that's going to cause a sheen on the leaves, you're going to want to do in the a.m. or dusk so then the sun doesn't burn them. Another option is diatomaceous earth, which is a um, sedimentary rock that actually clings to soft-bodied uh, insects and kind of um, dehydrates them. Wood ash is alkaline and dusty and does a similar thing. So anything that's drying or dehydrating um, would help as well. There are also a lot of other natural pest and weed control options on the Healthy Habitat page, as I said before. And then um, for as far as synthetic pest control goes, uh, EnviroHouse actually has a really great how-to on its, on its website, as far as that goes. Uh, the other thing we talk about is actually plants can be repellents as well. So I just kind of picked two of my my top pests such as slugs and aphids. Plants to repel um, slugs include mint, lemon balm, and parsley. Aphids are marigolds, mint, and basil. And then I included this chart here and this kind of, um, this, is a, this is a chart of organic pesticides, um, how they do what they're doing and uh, their toxicity level and what they're toxic, toxic to. So, um, like I said, I talked about neem oil. Um, it's not toxic to birds and mammals, and it has a low uh, toxicity in aquatic life. But these are still things you want to consider about how you want your space to be, uh, what you want to be eating, where you want your pets to be, and uh, just how, you're, how you want to go about um, pest, pest control in your, in your garden. The other thing I want to talk about is weeds for good. So weeds, simply put, is a plant in the wrong place. Uh, some weeds compete with desirable plants, are pretty tenacious and grow a little bit faster, and some spread invasively. Um, but one thing you could consider is leaving some of these in your garden. Well, examples of these, it, this one right here on the right is the purple dead nettle. It had its um, Pollinators like it. Dandelions. Uh, I saw a junco in my yard eating dandelion seeds the other day. Clover. Um, I feel like a lot of us in the Pacific Northwest are getting a little bit more keen to growing clover in our yards as, in, instead of just grass. Uh, oxalis or wood sorrel, which is up at the top here. It kind of looks like a clover with yellow flowers. Um, it is a uh, a good pollinator plant and then wild violet. And then this picture that is the background is actually my my uh, garden bed right now and I'm growing garlic in it and just kind of letting the wood sorrel and oxalis um, run free for now. So we've gone over planning or uh, prepping a, planning a site, prepping a site, going from there. Um, the next thing we want to talk about is purchasing and planting, which typically happens April through May in our area. And I would suggest to check out, once you've picked your plants, you can check out local nurseries for spring sales of live plants. Um, there's Woodbrook Native Plant Nursery in Gig Harbor, I love. Washington Native Plant Society has spring sale, Pierce Conservation District, Tacoma Nature Center, and Garden Sphere are all pretty local to here. Other places you can get are seeds from reputable region sources. And then, uh, you know, depending on what's available, you can be flexible and use your knowledge to make substitutions. You don't always need fertilizer, but if you think you do, I would consider using Tagro. And then you let it grow. Um, the great thing about a pollinator garden is it will grow back mostly every year because you're using perennials and a lot of reseeding types of plants. Um, and then also it's interesting to figure out what kind of microclimate you're in because that determines what will thrive. Some species will self-seed and spread and others will disappear. Last year I had a ton of um, bachelor buttons in my, my wildflower garden. This year I have, I think like five. Um, and then as your garden progresses or as you add more pollinator garden to your yard, you can add new colors and textures and heights and see what works for you. So like I said, these are 
there is some science to it. And then there's a little bit of experimentation as far as what works for you and what your preferences are. And I tried to put a little bit of both into here as an experienced uh, gardener and uh, try to work some, some different types of pollinators into this. So this is your resource and references list. Um, I wanted to say too with Tahoma Autobahn, just a little pitch for us. We um, are a membership organization. So I was wanted to ask, I think our last poll question would be um, if anyone was a member of Tahoma Autobahn yet who is on this, this uh, webinar with us. We're almost there with all the answers. Just a couple more seconds. Because Pat, we are not allowed to, we're set uh, on our webinar, we're set so that the panelists can't. But I'm a member of Tom Audubon and it's a great organization. So <laughs> I encourage everybody to check that out. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, so we're a member membership organization. Um, it's how we do most of our work is through our membership. And we offer things like classes, bird walks. Um, we have summer camps for young ones and we do education recreation from young, young all the way up. Um, one thing that we have coming up actually is our spring, uh, our major spring fundraiser is called Birdathon. And it's actually one of the coolest ideas for a fundraiser ever because you get to go out and and count birds. It's like a walkathon um, and pledge pledge to that. But this year, because of the uptick in kind of backyard and casual birders, we have a lot of other options and ways to get involved. Um, one is a May subscriber in which you subscribe and you get different activities and information sent to you every week. And then we'll actually have a big day on May 22nd in which we're offering pretty exclusive and special walks from some uh, some experts in the field that don't typically offer walks. One of the walks we're offering is a birding by ear. One is about bird photography. We have um, a marine biologist leading a walk at Titlow. Um, so I would encourage you to join. How you do that is you can do it through our website. You can give us a call. Uh, so you can do it on our website inside of line. Give us, give us a call. Um, and we'd love, we love to have you and give you some exclusive information about Tahoma Audubon. Um, we are a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> and you also, um, are you doing virtually the programs you used to do at Tacoma Nature Center periodically? Yes, yes. so we have a, um, for, we have a uh, speaker series every month uh, in which we have someone come and kind of do something similar to this. Um, we're also offering um, youth programming that we, we, our partner in education is the Tacoma Nature Center. So we do a lot with them. And then we do have, um, every month we're trying to set up um, fee-based classes too that are, that are we've had um, someone talk about uh, spring migrants. We've had a discussion on na how to get into nature journaling. We're hoping to have some on more specific birds and plants and things like that as well. So. That's where we're at now and stay tuned for more. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. You do not have to be a member to um, attend the virtual. No, you do not. You have to be a member to do the, do the in-person all the time. Yeah, and well, one perk of membership is you do uh, oftentimes get a discount on things that are fee-based, so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks so much, Britt. Um, Thank you. Before we get into the Q and A, we have a few questions um, that have come in, but I just wanted to remind everyone that this is part of Earth Month and we have a couple more events. You know, it's very last week of Earth Month really, but um, there are just a few more things um, that are coming up uh, this week. We have one more workshop on Friday. Um, we're gonna talk about um, how to repair your bike and biking in Tacoma with Second Cycle. I love Shelby, um, she's so great. <laughs> yeah, Shelly's going to be giving that talk, and she's going to give us a little tour around the Second Cycle facility, too, so that'll be really cool. She's going to have her camera, and she'll be there in the workspace, so if you want to take a look at Second Cycle right now, they're not, they're not, they're open on, like, a, you know, an appointment schedule right now, um, but we're going to be talking about that on Friday at 
430. And I'm just going to put the links in here to um, the Earth Month calendar at cityofjacoma.org forward slash Earth Month. You can also find all the workshops on the workshop page, which is linked there too at cityofjacoma.org forward slash workshops. And then, Janda, we have another event on Saturday, right? Yeah. We're doing on Saturday, and if you don't know about it, um, we're doing an introduction to the Tacoma Library. It's becoming more popular and better known. They're in their fifth year now. Um, they have over 1,700 tools and equipment that you can check out. I mean, everything, like just not household tools, but sewing machines and um, just a lot of things that if you only use them a few times in their big equipment, um, you know, don't go buy it and spend $100, $200 on something if you can go borrow it for a week or two, and that's all you need. Uh, so that's going to be Saturday morning at 1030. Um, and through all the things you need to know about, because they've moved there now with um, in the back from a public library. So they have space and they are, um, they're not for walk in, but you can um, check out the inventory online. And, um, and then you make an appointment, reserve what tools you want, and you make an appointment to pick up, and you drive in, and they'll bring them out to your car. So it's a really yeah. pretty cool thing. And then coming up very quickly, I won't go into that much detail, but in May, um, so that one, first of May, and then we will also be doing, on the 8th of May, we're doing with Helen, we'll be doing preserving fresh food with freezing. Uh, that'll be a new webinar. Um, May 12th, we are repeating the one that we did last month on um, soil health and climate change. Uh, that had some good reset and a lot of really good information in that one. That's on Wednesday, May 12th. And then May 15th, we're doing, should be of interest to people on this one, we're doing with the Native Plant Society. Um, we'll be doing native plants to enhance your habitat. And the last one in May so far, on the 22nd on herbs that you can grow, how to use them, how to preserve them. So you can find those on the website and um, we'll be getting them out in the Enviro News and in other locations. So that's Thanks, what's Jenny. coming up. And um, this has been real fun. Thank you, Brett. It's just great to have this connection with Audubon and have this mm -hmm. information. Yeah, I want to launch those last couple of poll questions um, so that we can get that sense of what you've learned and we can continue to improve. Um, we can, next time we do this workshop, we know what we can focus more on. Um, so I'd love to know, um, now having attended this workshop with Britt, um, how do you feel about um, your knowledge on being able to create some friendly places in your garden for pollinators and birds and um, how easy you think that'll be to do in your own yard? at home and um, I'll give you some time to fill those questions out while we go to Q&A. So a um, couple things that came through, um, one of our attendees is really interested in um, bees and um, you know those, those really good insects that we need in our, mm -hmm. in our gardens and you know for our agriculture and everything. Um, and they have some mason bees, but they'd like to know what other things they can do. And you mentioned, um, you know, the water dishes are helpful for mm -hmm. bees. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about mason bees and other um, helpful insects, that would be great. Yes, so I didn't touch too much on bees. I tried to focus more on birds, but mason bees are great. There are a ton of other bee species that are just as beneficial as pollinators. Um, and I would say that you absolutely you can order mason bees online and have a mason bee house um, come to your yard, which is wonderful. Uh, they are some of the first pollinators that come out, so that's really great. Um, the, I would say that one thing I would suggest is, like I said, I planted my pollinator garden and kind of just attracted them. I think the bright colored blooms, the smells, just kind of trying to um, look into, and there's a question about how to attract cedar waxwings, so trying to figure out what, what type of pollinators it is you want to attract, but basically planting a pollinator garden, there's a lot of overlap, which is Trump something I was trying to reiterate in there, like there's a lot of different plants that will attract a lot of different good pollinators to your yard. 
And I think, let me throw in on that, um, learn what the pollinators are. Um, there are some charts out there, so good information. Mm -hmm. A lot, a lot of the pollinators are things that you would normally think are pests, hover flies, and, mm -hmm. and things that don't look pretty like bees necessarily mm -hmm. flying around, but they do a really productive job in keeping plants going and um, just make sure you're not swatting something and killing it. Even the mason bees, if you're not familiar with them, they kind of like a big blue fly. Um, so just be cautious with, you know, how you're treating your critters in your yard. Yeah, and then also on that, um, you were just talking about finding out resources. So we did have a question too about the plant varieties and if you have those, the ones that you shared um, up on the website. I know I put some links in the chat to mm -hmm. native plant guides um, at, at the National Audubon site. Yeah, so we did a lot of um, research as far as what we, we wanted. Uh, Elise did this, a lot of research as far as what she wanted in her, uh, in the pollinator garden at Hess. Um, we don't have what is in our pollinator garden up yet, but the plan is for the Adriana Hess pollinator garden and rain garden to become kind of a teaching garden. So eventually we will have the species listed on our website as far as what's in there. Um, one thing I will say, like I was saying is everything's kind of trial and error. So I think we're trying to give it a little bit of time so people can actually like see and identify what's in there and that we make sure that it, it works and happens. Um, but Plants for Birds is really good. Um, as far as you can, you, what you do on Plants for Birds is you type in your zip code and it sends you a list of different native plants that will attract birds and by proxy, a lot of other types of pollinators. So if you're looking for somewhere to get started, um, you can type your zip code into that and that's a really good way to get started there. Again, um, Woodbrook Native Plant Nursery and any of these, any of these plant sales, um, also are native plants and a lot of them are pollinators as well. If you're looking for somewhere to get started. And just put that plants for birds link in the chat again. It's um, a great resource. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the question. And yeah, oh. I know you talked a little bit about this already with, you know, like do some research on the species you want to attract. Um, mm -hmm. But I was just thinking about, um, you know, cedar waxwings too, and a lot of these other um, birds. Um, you know, I, there's certain things I see in my yard all the time mm -hmm. and other things that I very rarely see. And I'm just wondering, you know, what is that? I guess you need to have a combination of certain trees and certain food yeah. types. Um, do you yeah. have any recommendations there? Yeah, so cedar wax wings, I guess it does depend on, um, if you're, if you really like a certain bird and you want a certain bird to come, you can look up and see what types of foods they're attracted to. So Typically, cedar waxwings are going to feed on fruits year round. So in the summer, things you could plant here would be um, like a service berry or strawberries, um, dogwoods, uh, raspberries. Those are all things that would grow well here. Um, and then in the winter, they're going to transfer a little bit to like madrone, uh, uh, juniper, mountain ash, uh, crab apples. Um, and then they also, in the summer, will switch to more of a protein-rich diet, such as those um, mayflies, stoneflies, dragonflies, and things like that. So they kind of, again, with the native species, they rotate their diet to what is available um, to the climate where they're living during that time. So, yes. Great. We had one more question come in. I think we have just in this. I know we're at, like right at 5.30, but um, so um, we had a, a comment saying yes. about bees. I, I, I never know what to do, you know, about yeah. bees either. Yeah, so um, I will say that feeders, uh, I'm, and I'm sorry you didn't touch on this, feeders are typically, what's gonna happen is birds are gonna be attracted to feeders in the winter when there is low sources of natural uh, food for them to eat. So ramping up your feeder during the winter months, um, you'll see a lot of birds like specifically chickadees and juncos, they're doing like cash, caches of food, they're like saving it, um, which is an inherent tactic uh, for them. And then um, once the, 
once the winter kind of tamps down, they will want to go to those fresh natural food sources like us. Like I haven't had a fresh, a garden tomato in months and I cannot wait for that. So they're kind of like us in that way. Um, you can keep your feeders out absolutely, but you'll see, you'll definitely see a decrease in uh, feeder, um, people are people birds are your feeders uh in the summer so having both options is is a great idea in your yard and the fact that your neighbor takes care of the the buys the seed and you plant the flower seems like a really great symbiosis as well great okay all right yeah. well thank you so much um thank you thanks everyone who came and um hopefully we can do some more workshops on birds soon again plug for for the spring bird drive right um yeah bird of check out the Tahoma Audubon Society website find out how you can do some birding in May thank you all so much thank for you. having me